Guru Raja cannot be seen without sporting this sacred clay. It's a holy place, shining in eternal glory over thousands of years, nay, even some eons. Such a sacred spot is an inexhaustible source of nature's bounty, meriting supreme sanctity. And if at all there has been any reduction in the extent of its spread, it is imperceptible to the human eye. Like the divine vessel Akshay Patra, it is limitless in its reward. Though seemingly incredible, the happenings there which we are able to discern as a perpetual phenomenon instill our belief in those. While a superficial look at it may not reveal anything exceptional, a deeper and wider examination of the contents of that place will bring out the unique characteristic of its effulgence like gold. It was a long felt desire in me to visit such a distinctive locale with utmost devotion for its divinity and when it was fulfilled by the grace of Sri Hari and the blessings of Sri Guru Raja for narration of its glory in this eighth volume of my serialized writing, it simply left me standing there in boundless exultation. As preached in the Bhagavad Gita and true to the mundane way of life, it is desire and greed that are the root cause for distresses. But these evils cannot be eschewed easily. In worldly life, three types of cravings are singled out as those bringing misery. And even if the fulfillment of our longings be causing ephemeral happiness, adversity invariably follows such euphoria. These yearnings, identified as urge for possessing land, fondness for gold and lust for women, should not be excessive, as spelled out in our scriptures and underscored by the exalted saints. Of these passions, it is the one for land that requires attention, as none can live without it, even if one be not entertaining any proclivity for it. In fact, without land, there can be no terrestrial world. Even at the bottom of the ocean, there is only land surface, as explained in an earlier volume. Whatever natural wealth we possess in this world, it is only obtained from the earth. The vast ocean, though roaring in front of us, its water cannot be consumed by us nor used for agriculture. It's only the subterranean water that is fit for our intake. And for plant life, soil is necessary. So too natural resources like oil, coal and minerals such as gold and iron are procured only from mother earth or land. But these are not ubiquitous and are confined to certain geographical regions only. And even if available in plenty for exploitation, their quantum varies from place to place. Coal is a carbonized plant matter found in the inner recesses of the earth, having undergone such transformation over thousands of years. It is found only in certain places and comes out of the depths of the earth when excavated by the mining process. It is common knowledge that it is the earth that provides everything, be that food, clothing or living space. In spiritual parlance, Mother Earth is known by the name Bhuma Devi. And wherever we may be stationed, we call the country we belong to as our motherland. The Lord Ulagalanda Perumal in the Vamana Avatara measured the world by placing just one foot of his on the earth, sequel to the promise made by Bali Chakravarti to gift him the extent of land to be covered by Three strides of his. The great Mahabharata war took place because the Kauravas had taken the stand that not an inch of space could be given to the Pandavas. Undoubtedly, without land, the world cannot certainly exist. Viewed in the real perspective, land or earth is what holds the world and the life sustaining thereon. For that matter, even the recluses and the spiritually exalted ones need land in their mundane life. As a corollary, desire for land is something normal in human life. 
a house is essential for one's living. Likewise, for ploughing and cultivating, arable land is required. Hermits too require land space for setting up ashram, while those adorning the seats of monastic orders need land for the functioning of the monastery or mutt. Sri Raghavendra Swami had covered many places on Padayatra, and yet for his undisturbed meditation and for living inside the Brindavana, he had obtained Manchala, Manchala village as a gift from Siddhi Masood Khan, which place is now known popularly as Mantralaya. In part 1 of this serialized writing, we have seen in detail the reasons for Sri Raghavendra getting Mantralaya as a benefaction, though it was mainly because it was the land on which Prahlada had performed Yajna, Sri Raghavendra himself had a magnetic attraction towards Manchala. That Sri Raghavendra, as Sri Vyasaraja in his earlier birth, had entered his Brindavana on the bank of the Tungabhadra river and later replicated it at the respective spots where Sri Prahlada had performed his tapas and yajna in preference to other places like where the child devotee had his tutelage and later darshan of the Lord, reveals the lure of the sacred Tungabhadra river and of goddess Manchalamma that had held a sway over him. It is indubitably the same influence that is drawing thousands of devotees to Mantralaya, where Sri Raghavendra's grace is ever radiant. Personally speaking, in my youth, I too had in me the deep-rooted fancy to possess land, house, but after its acquisition, it turned into greed. Yes, the avariciousness to acquire vast land for setting up a place of, for worshipping Sri Raghavendra in a Granthalaya envisioned for the purpose. If the desire be ethically sustainable and reasonable, it will definitely be fulfilled by the grace of Sri Hari Vayu Guru. And in this manner, how my longing ultimately turned out fruitful is narrated in the end chapters. In the way he got Mantralaya gifted to him for his Brindavana Pravesh, Sri Raghavendra has fa facilitated my getting as donation the land required for the establishment of his Granthalaya conformably with my heart's desire. Just as Mantralaya is on the bank of the Tungabhadra river, the Granthalaya to be established near Chennai is also at a place proximate to a source of water supply, a Tungabhadra reservoir, thanks to the blessings of Sri Guru Raja who has orchestrated it that way. How Tungabhadra could be in the vicinity of Chennai may be intriguing but it finds expli explication in the awe-inspiring information furnished about Sri Raghavendra Granthalaya elsewhere in this writing. The desire to possess landed property house may not always be for selfish ends, but even for the good of the society, such allurement may arise. Only then, the function of the efforts directed towards the benefit of the society at large will leave its impress on the sands of time. While we have seen that land is indispensable for human life and even precious things like gold and diamond are obtained from the depths of the earth, it is only to know about the strange phenomenon of getting a unique kind of clay from the earth that all the related aspects have been analyzed in detail thus far. The clay mentioned above has the power to make one's life prosperous and virtuous. Yes, its holiness and potence is unquestionable. Such a sacred and distinctive soil is confined to only one place on our planet and is available there even today. For thousands of years, it has been evolving and expanding at that spot, but only within a specific area. In fact, we can never imagine the picture of Sri Guru Raja without the sacred namas, religious markings, applied out of that clay. The next chapter is devoted to explaining everything about this holy object, what it signifies, where it is found, why and how it is got, what its sanctity is, 
and the glory that it carries.